Chase Rice has lived a lot of different lives. He's a former D1 football player, a former NASCAR pit crew member, a former Survivor contestant, and to super fans of the show, someone that many people think was robbed of winning the whole season, the truest ambassador of bro country by being one of the co-writers of Cruise, purveyor of the term sugar shaker by being one of the co-writers of Get Your Shine On, Slide a little sugar shaker. Prolific user of snap tracks and drum machines. We've been to both Carolinas, seen a big mountain. Victim of Bachelor producers in one of the most awkward reality show moments of the past decade. I have one more surprise for Victoria. We have our own private Chase Rice concert. I want to die. Chase Rice is my ex boyfriend. This is the most awkward thing. Did you not know that, like, you had no idea? And depending on who you ask, either an arrogant jerk or the scapegoat for everyone's collective pandemic rage and stir craziness for having an outdoor concert in 2020. But one life that Chase Rice has never really lived is that of a respected country music star. I mean, don't get me wrong, he has been incredibly successful, but when it comes to making country music that gets people thinking and talking and reflecting and really puts the music world all abuzz, that's never been Chase Rice until now. Chase Rice just dropped a new album called I Hate Cowboys and All Dogs Go to Hell, and it is one of the biggest career pivots I have seen in all of country music. It kind of reminds me of when Kelly Pickler went from releasing music like Best Days of Our Lives to the super country sounds of 100 Proof, or when Randy Hauser dropped the whole bro country routine and made Magnolia. It's not just a step, it is a leap in the direction of country music excellence. And it's so rare to see this a full decade into somebody's career, especially from someone that I don't think anyone was even looking to take seriously like Chase Rice. It's like the Fast and Furious franchise, when it just decided to get good all of a sudden in the fifth movie, and people were like, Wait a second, did the Fast and Furious movies just get good? That's how I feel about this new Chase Rice album. Like, damn. He just decided to become great. Ever since we heard Key West of Colorado like six months ago, it was pretty clear that Chase Rice was going to be going in a new direction musically. And he absolutely achieved that here. I mean, even just from looking at the cover of this album, a picture of Chase Rice's father just looking pretty damn badass. Do y'all remember that blog, Dads Are the Original Hipsters? That's how I feel about, you know, Mr. Marlboro Mustache Man in this picture. It looks badass. And Chase has said in press for the album, he made music that he thinks his dad would want to listen to. He was a hardworking man, and this is the type of stuff that he would want to hear. And immediately, even just visually, it's such a more grounded and country aesthetic than, you know, the Chase Rice that sang Ride back in the day, leaning against his car with the shades, singing about kissing her from her head to her toe. Like this music, the aesthetics, the writing, everything's just grown up and elevated a lot more on this record. And that makes sense because this is very much an album about transition, about that liminal space between who you've been or who your family has been and who you want to go be. Like you could call it, I'm not a bro, not yet a cowboy, because it's very much an album about growing up, about going from this wild child to being something a little more mature, about being someone kind of in the East that's been in this Nashville scene to kind of embracing like the West a little bit more. And there's definitely this kind of tension between East and West, Nashville and the Red Dirt scene that's a little bit on this album and makes it interesting. This quote in the press release I thought was super fascinating. People always say that Nashville is a 10 year town, that it usually takes 10 years of grinding to finally reach that moment of breakthrough success, reflects Rice. For me though, I was part of a group of songwriters that found lightning in a bottle immediately when I moved to town. It was a wild ride that I hung on to and tried to replicate as much as I could. What I've realized though, is that I never identified who I am as my own artist. Now a decade later, I know that my 10 years in this town were all about discovering my true self and getting to this point of releasing an album that I can honestly say reflects the man I want to be from start to finish. I read that after hearing the album and it totally tracks because this album really is a statement about making art that is substantive. I don't think the record necessarily has one coherent through line, like it's making an argument the way kind of like a divorce album does, but just this collection of songs coming from Chase Rice is the statement. 
That is what makes it interesting. So let's talk about the music. Met a guy named Tony Danny, singing tones the best kind of love. The sound of this record is really straightforwardly country with tinges of rock. You get a little bit of steel, you get a little bit of banjo here and there, but mostly you're getting kind of acoustic guitar, nice drums, and what's more interesting about the record sonically to me is what you're not getting. You are not getting big drum machines, you are not getting big snap tracks. This feels really grounded as music. And there's a guy whose name I hadn't actually heard that is the producer on this record named Oscar Charles. I think he's worked with LV Shane, some with Charlie Worsham, but as far as I can tell, he's a real up and comer and I'm very impressed with him as a producer here. At various times, the music on this album reminded me of Dirk's Bentley, especially on the really driving opener, Walk That Easy. Definitely Eric Church on Bad Day to be a cold beer. And there's even features on it from Texas staple Reed Southall Band, as well as Boy Named Banjo, who longtime viewers know I love. But much of the album is really just kind of open and acoustic and really breathes. I love that about it. I love just how subdued some of the production is throughout this album. There's a bunch of interesting songs on this record and some really just fresh feeling lyrics to me. Some of the writers include guys like Barton Davies, John Sherwood, uh, the producer I mentioned, Oscar Charles, William Reams, as well as uh, John Byron and Blake Pendergrass, who are a duo I've had my eye on ever since they wrote 865. And I was like, who wrote this song? This feels so different. And then I remember their names came up again on a random song. Chris Lane dropped it, Summer Job Money. They just bring a cool, slightly more stream of consciousness style of writing. And I love that. But I enjoy a bunch of the songs here. The one that has certainly generated the most conversation off the jump is track five, which is actually a solo rice by solo right by Chase, one of three on this album, and it's called Bench Seat. And we roll the windows down. Here this is a song all about reminiscing on the memory of riding with someone, and there's just that bench seat in between you and the car. And you can roll the window down and feel the warm air on your face and smell the fresh cut grass and wave to Mr. Reynolds as you're driving past him. And as the song goes on, this passenger sees other people join the car, whether it's a child or a wife or anything. And in the end, it's the driver that passes away, and our narrator says in the bridge, I always knew this day would come. I just thought I'd be the first called home. The little boy and her, don't worry about them. I've got them for now. See you soon, my friend. And if I'm reading the song correctly, and the video just sort of corroborated this thought, I believe the song is from the perspective of a dog. And you think at the beginning of the song, you know, that the guy has taken this dog in and is letting it look out the window. But really, you're seeing this song is maybe from the perspective of his dog. Um, and looking at him and for whatever reason this man doesn't live for as long as he should and Chase has talked in interviews about how uh, he had a friend that commits suicide but man just the song is very interesting and it, it could work even if it's about a person and it's cool to have songs like that on mainstream records. There's a lot of that honest self-reflection on this record. I've talked for a while now about how I love the song Key West to Colorado. Somewhere between Key West and Colorado I found God I think that it not only captures this sort of angst that Chase feels and trying to find who he is and this tension between the West, something out in the West calls to him. That comes up a number of times through this record, uh, but I also just think it's a really pretty melody. There's a similar theme on the song, I Walk Alone, where he talks about when it's cold out and he's feeling numb to find himself, he walks alone. And it could literally be about going on a really tough hike, but I think it's more saying metaphorically, He's had to make mistakes in order to grow and to push himself to find who he wants to be. That's kind of what this whole record's about. My other favorite plaintive song on the record is a little bit of a gimmicky one, I admit, but it's just so damn pretty. It's called All Dogs Go to Hell. And boots ain't made for cowboys and Chevy don't make trucks. And in this song, you're kind of getting a funny mix of like a country apocalypse that almost reminds me of like end of time by the band Perry. But in this case, it's more like opposite day where, you know, the John Deere tractor is blue and the bluegrass is green and nothing is making sense. And he says in the end, like, I ain't missing you. 
and all dogs go to hell. And the whole kind of thing, just I like that almost the point of the song is just hidden in that second to last line of the chorus where you just have to know he's saying only things that are untrue. So when he says, I ain't missing you, really the whole song's about how I miss you. It's a helicopter right freaking over my apartment. Although I must say, there's these three notes at the end of the chorus that run all through the song where it's like, dum, dum, dum. And my millennial ass, all I can think of is that dumb Disney Channel song that Hilary Duff sang called I Can't Wait, where she's like, bum, bum, bum. I swear it's the exact same as those three notes. And it's the same as uh, the end of the chorus in This Is My Town, na 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 by Montgomery Gentry. Yeah, this is my town. I don't know why I felt compelled to tell you that, but there you go. Not all the record is so sad and reflective. A lot of it is fun, and the other most notable track, I think, has to be Bad Day to Be a Cold Beer. Now, there's something in the songwriting world at the moment where this is a popular phrase, because we also had, two years ago, Walker Montgomery released that song, Bad Day to Be a Beer. Colby Acuff last year released a song called Bad Day to Be a Beer. Now we have Bad Day to Be a Cold Beer, and, um... This one's really a jam, I must admit. Partly because it sounds exactly like Eric Church's Drink In My Hand. I've even heard Chase talk about that a little bit, but I mean, it sounds exactly like it. And that said, that song rules. This one is catchy. You know, Eric, I'm sorry that your song kind of maybe slightly got ripped off, but it really sounds so damn catchy. <laughs> like, at the end of the day, it's still Chase Rice, and I think if I didn't have a party moment on the record, I would feel like I was missing out a little. Like, you want your bros to be a little bro-ish. There's also something that's really hopeful and encouraging about the energy of Walk That Easy. I love the imagery in the chorus about all the things that kind of decay and fade, like a smoke ring fades, and paint will rust, but love doesn't walk easy. Like. You don't just give up on it soon. There's something that's so driving and encouraging about that song. And I'm super into the boy named Banjo collab, Good Night Nancy. It's a good night, Nancy, come dance with me. This is like such a jam. It a little bit reminds me of uh, Galway Girl by Ed Sheeran. Maybe, or maybe I'm thinking of Nancy Mulligan. That's probably what I'm thinking of. She and I went on the run, don't care about religion. But regardless, Maybe I just love sing-alongs about Nancy's. In this song, he drives down to the coast. He wants to go where the salt meets the sand. And he's not there for a tan. He just wants to go to this crappy little honky-tonk, this little roadhouse, and dance with Nancy. And just that repeated, Good night, Nancy, come dance with me. Like, it's such a bop. It's so sing-alongable. It really feels raucous. Love it. Now, Boyne and Banjo isn't the only collab on the record. There's also a collaboration with the Reed Southall Band on the song... Oklahoma. And this song is simply about Chase Rice not wanting to leave Oklahoma. He just freaking likes it there. And this kind of becomes this red dirt opus where he lets the Reed Southall band just kind of shred on guitar and it has this kind of woozy, moody, rock out guitar solo. And it's so unexpected. It's this very interesting kind of handshake between Nashville and the Red Dirt scene, you know, two scenes that don't always like each other so much. And I feel like we're seeing more and more and more of that in music right now, which is very cool. But the song also gets to a sense that is on this record, which is Chase Rice recognizing that he's not a cowboy and even kind of owning a little bit of a resentment about that. I feel like it's kind of like a wink to the Texas music scene, this other side of country music and life that is kind of coming to the forefront of culture right now. And that manifests in two very opposite songs. There's kind of the hit from the album, if you can even call it a hit yet, Way Down Yonder. And I I'm not the fondest of this song. I find it a little like overly loud and kind of dress up y as this sort of like saloonish song where I, I don't know. I don't like when he's playing like I am a cowboy as much as I like the album closer called I Hate Cowboys. I hate cowboys. Where basically he's just trashing cowboys. I mean, listen to this. 
Their hats just look so stupid. I hate their Wranglers and their boots and all them jukebox red dirt songs. Man, I hate cowboys. They think they're scared of nothing, run their mouth about bulls bucking, but eight seconds ain't that long. I wish they'd stay their ass at home because they think they're John Wayne walking through the door, turning every head, including yours. And and that's kind of where you get to it. Like basically this girl is after a cowboy, you know, some people might disparagingly say that is a buckle bunny. But, <laughs> but basically he loses his girl to a cowboy. So now, you know, he's throwing all of them out in the garbage because like, I hate cowboys. He's jealous. That one he wrote with Hardy and Brad Tercy and Ross Copperman. It's a different flavor than the rest of the album, but I love it. It's kind of a companion to Zach Bryan's if she wants a cowboy. I mean, I could go through every other song, but I'm not going to. I don't want to get in the habit of doing every single track. Those are the ones that just stood out to me on the album the most. I'd say if there are three songs from this album that I love the most, it's probably Bench Seat, Good Night Nancy, I just love. Uh, I love Bad Day to be a cold beer, and I love, um, I do love All Dogs Go to Hell. I, I like a lot of the songs here, so it's hard to winnow it down, but uh, I am just encouraged, excited, proud in a way of Chase Rice and what he did with this album. And it's always cool when you see a star in a more determined manner sort of step into higher caliber of art. You know, I feel like we're seeing a lot of that. I mean, last week was just a crazy week with Ernest and Kelsey. And yes, I'm going to talk about these things. But I feel like Chase just did something very cool with this record. And... Uh, there's not much on it that I want to skip. And yet, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say it's a masterpiece or like, you know, I'm going to go back to every one of these songs all the time, but it's just a rock solid listen start to finish. And I think that is pretty damn cool. So I would love to know what you guys think of this album. Um, I think I'd probably give it like, I don't know, like a strong, I don't know. I don't know. I hate rating albums because honestly, I'd give like every album a B plus if I could, but I just liked it a lot. Okay. I liked it a lot. And if we're grading on a curve, it's like an A plus because my expectations for Chase are low. Okay. Um, <laughs> they are, they are. I mean, right when he was starting off was when I was getting into country and I was so pissed about bro country. I interviewed him on the freaking red carpet of the CMA awards in 2013 and just held a mic out to him or a recorder or whatever I was doing. And was like, what do you think about bro country? Do you feel like you're responsible for it? <laughs> like I was such a little twat in those days. Uh, but I'm glad I was because that's what gave me a career and I wasn't wrong. Um, I'm glad we have shamed all the artists into making better music. You know, I kind of think that maybe this album is an example of what everyone said of how the music that's going to come out of the pandemic period where people were home, stuck with their own thoughts, not being able to tour, kind of forced into reflection is going to be really good. I feel like this album is a great example of that. And so um, I'm proud of the dude for finding his sound and... I'm rambling. I want to know what you guys think of it. So let me know in the comments down below. I'll be back with more country music stuff very soon. And um, that's all. Bye. Bye.